There we go. There it is. So Davy is a knock-in a Scottish traveller, advocate and social justice campaigner. He's supported community members in everything from evictions to planning decisions to cases of hate, crime and discrimination. His work involves supporting, a pol- involves supporting policymakers at a local, national and international level to increase the inclusivity of policy towards Gypsy, Roma and Travellers peoples. Um, he's spoken regularly around the country and in the media internationally about the discrimination faced by traveller communities, uh, has been a frequent contributor to shows like BBC The Social, as well as writing articles and features for various outlets. Um, his key passion is empowering the voice of seldom held, seldom heard people, peoples in dialogue to create better understanding. And to this end, he's also um, been involved in managing local, national and international projects to work uh, towards a more progressive societal conversation towards social change and acceptance. And I believe that for at least part of his life, he grew up in Argyll. Um, so tonight, I think, is going to be a really interesting discussion on Scottish traveller communities with a wee bit of focus on the Argyll community. So, Davy Donaldson, thanks for joining us. Um, if you'd just like to take it away. Thank you very much for that kind introduction as well. Um, yeah, I, I love coming along to these things because it allows me to talk about the culture that I'm so richly passionate about, the culture that I was brought up within, and that is, of course, the culture of the Scottish Nakin. Now, I appreciate to many on this call, Nakin might be a new term. Uh, don't worry, we'll go into that. We'll go into the reasoning why I use the term Nakin instead of the more, uh, I suppose, commonly used term, which is Scottish traveller, which might be similar to uh, certainly many of you on this call. Um, before I begin, what I'm very, very keen to do, not least because we're basing this within some degree of geography in, in, in Argyll, um, is to allow first a voice from the community, a, a voice that I was very, um, I, I've always strongly looked up to. Um, he was an activist. A storyteller, a writer, a composer of, of song as well. Um, and he was also a famous face in, in Argyll. And that was, of course, Duncan Williamson, a very famous uh, Scottish knacking man in and of himself and a very successful activist. So I'd like to pass over to him, first of all, um, and to allow his voice to come to you and to explain to you a little bit of what I will hopefully go into later on today. Now, hopefully, this will work. It worked before we started. <laughs> now, I must finish with a new song of all, composed by myself, The Hawker's Lament. <laughs> Oh, come all you hawkers, you men of the road, you hawkers who wander on. My story, it's sad, for it saddens my heart, for they've closed all our camping grounds down. Though we fought for we're country, and we fought for we're king, and some gave their life for this land. It's out there in Dunkirk. It's many they fell with their blood mixed up with the sand. But what did they fight for and why did they die? For freedom to wander around. But where can we wander? We have no place to go, for they've closed all our camping grounds down. They say we are not wanted to keep moving on. 
ואוהד בירין אור בשנו But where can we move to when we move along? For we have got nowhere to go. So listen, my boys, if another war should come. Just you keep moving around. Oh, I think Davy might have disappeared, but I'm hoping that he will be back. So if we sit tight, uh, hopefully we'll hear the end of that really nice lament, actually. So um, if we just want to hold fire a second. Well, to live in rural Scotland. Ah, that's disappointing. Right, well, I'm not sure when you've left me. Um, <laughs> just, about, just about 30 seconds ago. We got about to about two minutes and 18 seconds into that okay. uh, song. Well, that's disappointing. Well, what I will do is um, I'll send that to all of you um, afterwards, and I do encourage you all to listen to it. Um, but I'll continue with the presentation because time is certainly of the essence. Um, I, I didn't say where I was joining you from. I'm joining you from up near Pitlochry in Scotland, and uh, we're not known for our strong Wi-Fi signal. <laughs> so I apologise sincerely for that. Um, nonetheless, we'll continue. Okay. So who you heard from there was Duncan Williamson, and the reason that I shared that Firstly, not least is because, of course, we're talking about Argyle here, but also because as an activist, Duncan Williamson was very, very crucial in not only my decision to become an activist, but in my journey through activism. He was first and foremost a storyteller, but he used the stages that he was given, the platforms that he was given at a time in the 1970s and 1980s, where it was very, very difficult as a Nakin, as a traveller, to be heard by policymakers and decision makers. And he used that stage. And the reason I shared The Hacker's Lament is a song that he wrote. And in itself is, is a, a lament, but it's a, a song of activism. It's a song of struggle. And to me, it really encapsulates not only the work of Duncan Williamson, but the work that I'm engaged in now as a young, as a young activist. So who are the people that he's discussing in that song? And I suppose, who are the people when we talk about this term, gypsy traveler or traveler, a term that I'm sure many of you are familiar with? That's something that I will go into in this talk. And I'll also talk about how that terminology relates to me and why I personally choose not to define as a gypsy traveler or a traveler. I'll also talk about place. Place is something that's just so, so, so important to understanding Nakan culture, Nakan communities, and Nakan people. Despite being a semi nomadic people as far back as you can go in, in Scottish history, particularly, we have a deep rootedness to place, something which many uh, first assume we don't have. Many assume because we're traveling and because we were semi nomadic for all of our history. They assume that we don't have this rootedness and we don't have deep connection with landscape. Of course we do. So I will explain a bit more about that. And lastly, I want to talk and I suppose bring it more down to, to heritage, bring it to well, what can we do you know, as individuals and also as professionals. And I'm going to introduce a term which to some of you may be familiar, but certainly to me it was new in the terms of the Scottish context. And that is sacred. I'm going to introduce the term sacredness and 
propose it is used in a more nuanced way to both protect and better understand how minority communities, in this case the Nakan, reflect and see themselves within the landscape. But before we get into all that, I want to dissect this term. And for those of you that have been at Talks of Mine in the past, you'll be familiar with this slide. But it's certainly one that I'm always keen to, to have present, no matter what I'm talking about. Now, the term gypsy traveller, to many of you, might be familiar. We tend to see this terminology in newspaper articles, social media posts. We also see it in policy and decision making as well. But what I want to express to everyone here today is the term gypsy traveller hides a lot of meaning. That there are many communities homogenized within this term. And often the term gypsy traveller is not used on the grassroots level within these communities. So when we use the term gypsy traveller, the communities that we're referring to are Scottish travellers, Scottish gypsy travellers, in our own language, the Nakan, Irish travellers, in their own language, the Pave or the Minka, Romani gypsies, and Welsh gypsies or Cali. Now, those four groups are the ones that we refer to under the term gypsy traveller. But many of you might also be familiar with other travelling communities, like the show people, for example. Now, the reason the show people aren't in this terminology is because they're yet to receive ethnic minority status. But despite that, it's very important that we recognise the shared solidarity between our communities and in cases as well, the shared relations and genetic makeup between show people um, and some of these other ethnic communities. Now, there's some resources that I'll share um, after today as well, which dissects these communities even further and gives you a bit more in terms of the etymology of each of these words and also the origins and the belief systems of each of these communities. Don't really have the time to go into it today, but to quickly run over it so that we have a degree of understanding. Scottish Nakin are presumed to be indigenous to Scotland. I'll go into that more in a second. Irish travellers are indigenous to Ireland. That's been proven by DNA studies as well as linguistic studies. The Romani gypsies are part of the gypsy diaspora. Now, all Romani people, including the Roma in mainland Europe, which are the largest minority in the world, totaling some 14 million people, they all come from India originally, particularly the Punjab region. Now, we know that via linguistics and lots of studies that have been done over time. And certainly, if any of you are interested in those studies, do give me an email after today, and I'm very happy to send you some. But what we know is that they left India for some reason. There's lots of stories. Um, they, they left India anyway, and they fled or they, they migrated up through Eastern Europe settling as they went. That's why you get large pockets of Roma and the likes of Bulgaria, Romania. There's no connection between Romania and the term Roma. Just settled there. Up through Eastern Europe and then to Scandinavia, where, where the Roma migrated to. Now, when they came from Scandinavia, they then landed in Scotland. And the reason I'm going into all this detail is that when they landed in Scotland, they met the pre-existing indigenous nomadic people, the Nakan. And of course, we intermarried, and there's, you know, there's lots of evidence of that, and many claim that it was because of our shared marginalisation, because of our shared nomadism. For whatever reason, we certainly intermarried. And as the Roma continued to travel down through Scotland and into England, they, of course, stopped with the English Channel. And that's where you get the contemporary Romani gypsies or English gypsies. So we're all different, right? And we're all unique in our own ways. We all share nomadism as a, a cultural pillar. But what's really important to understand is the differences in origins, the differences in linguistics, and often the differences in how our culture relates to us and certainly how we relate to it. Now, I'm going to focus during this presentation on the Nakan. The main reason for that is because I am a Nakan myself. I think it would be disingenuous of me to sit here and give you the mm -hmm. experience of a Roma person or um, you know, an Irish traveller, because that doesn't relate to my lived experience. 
I'm also focusing in on the knacking because when we talk about geography, and particularly Ar- Ar- Argyll and, and the west of Scotland in general, the communities and families which made that home tended to be knacking families. So who are the knacking? We're vastly considered an indigenous people with our own oral accounts placing us as a community back as far as the 9th century. We're a distinct ethnic minority, separate from Roman Gypsies and Irish travellers. And we gained that ethnic status in 2008. We're historically a semi-nomadic people, with much of our tradition and beliefs being linked to nomadism today. Whilst many of our community continue to go on the road or shift, and we see nomadism as a key part of our identity, you don't need to ever go on the road to be known as a Nakin or to self-identify as a Nakin. And that's a really important point that I want to get across. It's in your blood. You're born Nakin. You can't choose to be a Nakin if you go and live in a trailer for a wee while. Um, Nakin, you choose not to be a Nakin. We have a unique belief system and heritage in Scotland with camps scattered across the land and oral histories dating back centuries. When I was getting brought up, I was brought up in among song and story tradition. It's very strong in my family. And the songs and stories when I was growing up were sort of, you know, they were every corner. Whenever you would turn a corner, you would be told a story or you'd be told about one of your ancestors, your granny, your great granny, all these people that came before you who lived and inhabited those camps and those lands. Now, it wasn't until later on in life that I learned that those songs and stories were often centuries old. Some of those songs that I was taught as a bairn growing up in Scotland, just a common song that you'd hear your granddad or your uncle sing at night, I was later to learn went back to the 12th century. So we're a very, very historical people, yet that history is experienced in a very real sense in real time. I'll go back onto that later on. Now, when we talk about the size of our community, it's very difficult to get a grasp of just how many Nakin there truly are. There's lots of reasons for that. The main reason is that most Nakin people will never self-identify as Scottish Gypsy Traveller, which is, of course, on the official monitoring forms, for fear of discrimination, for fear of being excluded, or for fear of reprisals or hate attacks. Our population, because of that, sits statistically around 4,500. However, it is well known that many Nakin don't admit their ethnicity, and therefore the more accurate suggestion comes from that of the NGOs who work with us. And their suggestion is that the population sits between 15 to 20,000 people, which to me still seems a little bit low, but I guess it's the most accurate recording that we can go on. And just to draw your attention here to some photos. Now, this is a, one of my family camps um, out near Oban in Tamil. And what you can see here is quite a common image across, particularly this time of year, across Highland Scotland. You'll see gatherings of trailers, camper vans, folk and families being at home in the landscape. Now, to many out of our community, this is all you see. From a distance, you don't get to know the people, you don't get to know how they're experiencing that land, the stories they're telling, the songs they're singing, the importance of that landscape to them. And what I'm hoping to do during this talk is to bring you into the camp and tell you a bit more of what it's like from the inside. Up here, you have some historical images. And this one here is at the Ammon Bank in Perthshire, well, Perth. Um, Again, a site that might be familiar to some of you. There's now a a settled gypsy traveller site there, Double Dykes. This is a very old picture in the sense that what it represents is the way that Nakin people lived for centuries. You can see here a bow camp. It's quite a wee bow camp. Um, Now, the way a bow camp was built was bowed hazel. You can see... Some of these still, if you go to the Highland Folk Museum, for example, now uh, Ockham Drain as well, um, build these so you can go and see it in person and, and you know tangibly touch these things. But it was bowed hazel with canvas put over the top. 
it's thought that in historic times it would have been hide. Now, that's the way that, that Narkin lived for centuries because it worked. When you can look at the design of the tent, it mimics the design of a modern tent. Now, what is important to recognise is that this invention of ours worked perfectly for the landscape. And at the same time that Narkin were building these forms of tents, settled people were building big pointy tents which caught the wind. So even just looking at the camp from externally, you can see the ingenuity of the indigenous knowledge that was certainly present then as it is now. Here you can see the sticks from a bow camp and of course a family on the move. Now these images at the top here are certainly from our history but what I want to get across in this is that whilst we might live in a different thing in a different vehicle now we're living in trailers as opposed to living in bow camps it's the same people. We're just displaced by time. So many times I come on to talks or I go out and I meet particularly people in the older communities and they, they'll they say things like, yeah, you know, the travellers are gone now, the tinker people are gone, which of course is an older word. You know, we don't see them here anymore. And what I try to get across to people is we're the exact same folk, but we're just living differently. So to talk a little bit about that history and the shared connection with Scotland's story. Nakin, or Tinkers, as we were once known, now a derogatory term, were first recorded in Scotland around 1100. And that was in a set of laws called King David's Farrenman Laws. Now, these Farrenman Laws were created to support and protect travelling salespeople, of which the Tinkers or the Nakin were a part. It wasn't until the first, it wasn't until 1505 that we had the first gypsy being recorded in the UK. And upon meeting a band of gypsies in Stirling, King James IV proclaimed their leader, Johnny Fa, the King of Little Egypt, the first ever King of the Gypsies in the UK. Now, the term gypsy, like the term tinker, has a very long history, and it in and of itself tells you of the stereotype, the misinformation, and the mistrust at times between the two communities. Gypsy comes from the word Egyptian, and that's because when the first Romani landed here in Scotland, because they were darker skinned and because they spoke a foreign language, it was presumed that they were Egyptians. And that's why you had the king of Little Egypt, we proclaimed in Johnny Fa. Of course, over time, Egyptian, Egyptian became more colloquial, it became, you know, used more often, and that's when we got it boiled down to the word gypsy. The term tinker is thought to originate from taina kert, which meant the craftsperson of tin, calling back and harking back to the fact that many Nakin were tinsmiths, and that's what we made our trade in. Now, between 1505 and the 1570s, we start to see what was traditionally a very um, amiable relationship between the settled communities and the, certainly the Nathan community and, and the Gypsy community. We started to see that becoming a bit more insidious, and we started to see legislation coming into play, which was really put at to try and force uh, Gypsies and Nathan people into a sedentary way of life like everybody else. Now, Johnny Farr was highly respected. It's recorded that his sisters danced at Holyrood Palace, that he himself was gifted a palace, which is now a cottage um, in Kirk Yetlin, which you can go and stay in, I think it's a B&B. Um, I'm not being paid to advertise that, but that's, <laughs> that's my understanding. Now, despite all of that, and despite being held within quite high echelons of society, we started to see in the 1570s Nakin and Gypsy people being ordered to stop travelling or to leave Scotland entirely. And many families were indeed deported. And into the 1700s and, and late 1600s, this started to take on a much more menacing face. And the punishment was now that you would be hanged for the crime of being a Gypsy or a Nakin under the 
anti-gypsy uh, legislation. Now, there are many records from across Scotland of people being hanged for the sole reason that they were born Nakin or gypsy people. Um, but the last example we had of that came from 1714, where we saw two Nakin people, Jean Bailey and Agnes MacDonald, being sadly hanged at the grass market in Edinburgh. And to make the tale even more tragic, it's widely recorded that Agnes MacDonald was pregnant at the time of hanging. Into 1715 and, and on onwards, whilst we started to see at least the official um, hanging of, of gypsies in the and end, what we did start to see was a new form of punishment. And that was gypsies and Nakin being forcibly migrated abroad, many of which being taken slave plantations across the Caribbean and Americas. We have, again, uh, a record from that time in 1715 of a number of Nakin men being taken from a port in Glasgow and forcibly shipped to a slave plantation in Virginia. Now, to bring it forward a little bit more into the late 19th century, and the last point of history that I really want to share is the 1895 report. Now, in 1895, the church, supported by the government, launched an inquiry into what they termed the tinker problem. Now, what they wanted to do was solve what they saw as a social menace, social disgrace. They saw Nakin people and gypsy people being of a very low class of people. They expressed them as dropouts. There's words like primitive having been used. And what they wanted to try and do was to solve what they seen as that problem. And one of the main recommendations from that report was eradication is the only cure. Now, that word, of course, sends shivers down anybody's spine. To give you a little bit of context around how that recommendation was made, adds to, certainly adds to the tragedy of the whole thing. That decision was made out of the belief that was held by decision makers at the time, and certainly those involved in that inquiry, that there was no hope for adult knacking, um, but there was hope for the children. And so from 1900 onwards, we started to see mass acts and practices being pushed out into Scotland, both locally and nationally, that seek to segregate and exclude knacking people from society. Now, whilst gypsy traveller history in general is littered with persecution and oppression, and you can look across Europe and, and indeed across America as well, uh, and Australia, you know, really anywhere you look, you'll find examples of legislation or practice which was discriminatory or exclusive towards gypsy traveller or Roma peoples. But what we need to focus in on here is the slight discrepancies which exist in a Scottish context. And that is, the marginalisation took a much more tangible tone here. We saw reservations being built for Scottish knacking people. We saw children being forcibly migrated abroad en masse. So it's important that we're aware of this, both as individuals and as professionals. And particularly as professionals, if we're seen as having any degree of authority in society, knacking people look at those professionals as part of the system, right? And that system was what persecuted and excluded our people for centuries. So it's important to be critically aware of that when we're reading about these examples and hearing about them. Now, the 1895 report was indeed the start of this mechanism. And we saw hundreds of knacking children being rounded up and sent to Canada and Australia as domestic and farm servants. The children were often told that their parents had died. They were not able to contact them, nor were they ever told that the, the parents had fought for them or wanted them. Many of those who experienced this actually said that they'd been told that their parents didn't want them. Now, mostly the children were never heard from again. Now, we are getting to a stage now with social media 
and an online presence that some of these children are starting to reconnect with their past and reconnect with their roots. And it's through those reconnections that we're starting to learn the horrible atrocities that, that actually happened then. Now, the forced shipment continued until the outbreak of World War I, and again after until World War II. But thankfully, the accounts, at least the statistical accounts, do tend to kind of peter off after World War II. However, it might be it might be less that, that these things didn't happen and much more that they weren't recorded because we do know from lived experience that the forced migration and removal of children continued in the late 20th century, right on until the late 1970s. So this chapter in Scotland's history left a legacy of intolerance towards nomadic children throughout the late 20th century, with some knacking people talking, only talking out later in life. So I would urge everyone on this call to look into the likes of Patsy White, who herself was removed from her home. She wrote No Easy Road in 2009. We also have Sandy Reid, who wrote Never to Return in 2008. But it wasn't only that we were removed from our communities, but it was also that we were segregated, made to feel different within society, and society made to think of us as different. Two examples of this can be seen here. Firstly, we have the bobbin mill, which is this photo here. And it's a hugely important landmark for Nakin, and it lies just outside Pitlochry in Persia. But it is not remarkable for any positive reason. The bobbin mill was a group of small dilapidated shacks built in the 1940s, which were the first attempt at what was called a traveller reserve. Newspapers from the time hailed these forced housing experiments as necessary to reform what they thought of as our primitive minds. They didn't believe that Nakin could go and live straight into houses from the road. They believed that we would have to be sedentarized over a couple of generations in order for our brains to be at a stage where we could then handle living in us. Now, some Nakin living in and around Persia had to abandon their nomadic lifestyle and live within these shacks. Many of them were threatened with having their children taken away from them. Now, the official documentation records the bobbin mill as an experiment site, and families who experienced the harsh living conditions at the bobbin mill are now calling for an official apology for the trauma that it caused them. If you'd like to learn more about the bobbin mill, and I'd certainly urge you to, please look into the work of Rajpot, and the work of Seamus McPhee and Rosanna McPhee, who themselves lived through the experiment. One more, examples of, one more example I'd like to share with you is that of the little school at Aldur. Now, at Pitlochry in 1938, the decision was taken to build a separate school for Narkin children. And this was at the request of the local community, who stated they would not send their children to school with a traveller child. The school's curriculum was rudimental. To many knack and it felt dumbed down. And this school, again, is another clear example of how Nakin have been excluded and how Nakin children have been made to feel marginalised within society. Now, both of these examples are by no means exclusive. We see examples of reserve, reserves being built across Scotland. We see examples of segregated schooling in many forms from Thurso right down to the borders. So by focusing in on these two examples, I don't want to leave you thinking that they're exclusive. Please do look into your own areas because I can guarantee you'll find examples there. But the key message from this slide, and the one that I carry with me as an activist, is that I learned about the apartheid. I learned about segregation in the US, and quite rightly, but never at school was it ever taught about segregation and exclusion of my community here in Scotland. Okay. So what does all this mean? And the reason I'm going over this history isn't to just bring you down a, a road of tragedy and, and sorrow, 
It certainly isn't. It's to give you a degree of understanding to not only the place where I'm coming from as a young Macan activist, but also the reasoning that I believe exists for some of the inequalities that we continue to see among Macan communities today. So if you look at the statistics and look at Macan people in Scotland, you'll find that we are disproportionately affected by inequalities on every measure that the state has. And I've gathered some of them for you here, and I can certainly issue with some of the reports after this if you'd like to see them. We have high depression rates, much higher than that the settled community. Some statistics saying that they might be, a knack in person might be 25 times more likely to suffer from depression than that of someone in the settled community. We have high suicide rates, seven times more likely to commit suicide than someone in the settled community. Higher infant mortality rates and a lower life expectancy by at least 10 years. Now, these statistics are stark. The NHS has tried to get their heads around what's causing these statistics, how these statistics are not coming down, right? There's been work happening and, and you can't see it decreasing. Why is that? And I think it lies within our history. And I think it lies within the fact that most settled people don't know about our history. Because when you go out and you speak to the community, which I did, and you show them these statistics, and you say, look, what do you think is causing it? Why do you think these statistics exist? What do you think the issues are? You get comments like this. We've lost the old way of life. It's hard on that. How can we trust? Tell me, how can we trust when they took our ways? Then they speak to can't. Can't is the Macan language. Country folk will ken, you'll be the worst for it. Country folk's a word used for settled people. And lastly, try raising your burns when society is against you. They'll never accept our way. They never have. It's like for us to be in trailers makes us them's enemy. And to me, what these, statistics, uh, what these comments from the community show is that the statistics don't sit in silo, right? The statistics don't just sit on a government report and they're only experienced in that government report. But the fact that these statistics exist is because of a significant belief within our community that we're being impacted by cultural erasure. This, the segregation and the exclusion which happened throughout the 20th century and the late 19th century has boiled down to a place where we're seen to be different within Scottish society. We're seen to be less than. And if you're brought up being seen by everyone around you as less than, as different, as not belonging, then you're going to experience some of these inequalities. So how can we start to remedy that? And I think one of the key ways that we can remedy that is by better knowledge around what place means. And I have what I call the trinity of place. And that is understanding place has three immediate and important uh, impacts on knacking people. And that's health, heritage, and safety. So what does it mean about health? What do I mean by that? Well, the easiest way that I can explain it to you is explaining what it was like for me to grow up and to go on the road and, and live on the road. Shifting is what we call going on the road. And again, it's when perhaps we're most visible as a community because what it's important, it's important to recognise that many of us do live in houses, but it only in the summer months and spring where we can be visible and seen as a distinct people, right? And so shifting to me was both the happiest time and the worst time. It was the happiest time because it's a way of reconnecting with our past. It was a way for me to learn about my ancestors, the folk that came before me. And it was a way for me as well to learn about my belonging. When I lived on, on a camp, or stayed on a camp, I would learn about that camp. I'd learn about that piece of land. You know, I'd learn stories that connected me and my family to that piece of land, the songs that would connect me there. Things that you can't read, you can't learn in a book. You have to be taught. And our oral history is so deeply ingrained within the landscape. It was only actually getting out into the landscape 
that you get to hear more of that and learn more about your own oral history. But it was also the saddest time because going out onto the road meant facing barriers. It meant struggling to get to a toilet. It meant struggling to get access to clean drinking water, struggling to get access to somewhere to wash. It meant watching hate crime on a daily basis. For travellers on the roads, and, and certainly for us growing up, we would see hate crime as an everyday occurrence. It was something that you was normalised. It was something that you'd grow to accept. Being followed around a shop, for example, being seen as a thief based only on your ethnicity would happen all the time. There'd be folk would drive past the camp and they'd shout out racist slurs or they would throw things. You'd have to watch as these things happen and take it on the chin. Now, some families shift in order to find employment. Some families live on the road. Some families go on the road seasonally to reconnect with their history. We all shift for different reasons. But what's really important to understand is that when you see a family at the side of the road, they're there for a reason. We're there because we're experiencing our culture and we're expressing our culture in a way that matters and means has meaning to us. We also go to festivals and events throughout the year. For example, Appleby Horse Fair down Cumbria, as well as the conventions, the Light and Life missions uh, across Britain as well, which is a growing church within our community. Now, these events are usually huge and they act as melting pots for people of different traveling cultures to come together to meet and to share our culture. Many of these events have specific traditions attached to them. So, for example, in Appleby, it's seen as a rite of passage for a young person to ride a, a horse into the River Eden and to wash their horse. But the issue when it comes to the health inequalities and the connection to land comes when most of our traditional camping places and ancestral sacred camping places have become unauthorised. They're now blocked off with boulders or there's ditches dug around them. There's barriers put up to stop us from accessing these places. There are very limited legal places for Mackin to stay, either due to direct racism or bans on things like commercial vehicles in caravan sites, which make it very difficult for us to use settled people's caravan sites and amenities. It's also thought that the eviction that we experience when on the road, being pushed from pillar to post, you'll see it in the media all the time, is a main contributor to the suicide rates that we see, particularly among traveling men. So what I want to get across to you in this slide is that shifting is a crucial part of the culture to me. It was when I felt most happy, but it's also getting increasingly difficult. The nomadic knacking in Scotland are increasingly being pushed to the margins and we're increasingly seeing families no longer going on the road. And to me, I think that would be a massive loss, not only for my culture, but for Scottish society to no longer have these nomadic communities experiencing the landscape in a different way. Now, I'm going to quickly skip over this because I'm aware of time and I can, I can ramble on, but I'll make sure everyone has these slides afterwards anyway. Um, it's just another connection to the road and to place. Now, in our communities, there's no official dating. It's not really something that we do. Um, it's seen as taboo. Um, it just it doesn't tend to happen. Now, what instead tends to happen is courting, is what we call it. And it tends to be when uh, you know two people will start talking to each other um, and they will get to a place where they will decide that they want to be together. And at that point in time, they will traditionally do what we call running away. And they'll run away, right, as the name would suggest. And they'll go away um, back onto the road usually for a period of days or weeks, depending on the family and the couple. Now, the important part about this is that many families, particularly on the West Coast, have particular places that they visit when they run away. And two of these places are the Roman Rock and the Tinker's Heart. 
Now, the Lomond Rock, as the name would suggest, is found on Loch Lomond. Giant big rock, locals call it the Gypsy Rock. Um, and it's well known among some Scottish traveller families, Nakam families, that they'll run away and they'll go and they'll touch this rock either immediately after running away or immediately before returning. We don't know why, it's just a tradition that has always been done. Another place where it's traditionally recorded Nakam would run away to is the Tinker's Heart in Argyll. Um, which I'll go on to explain a bit more in a second. But what I want to get across to you in this slide is that our relationships with the road are so deeply entrenched that even for families who don't live roadside anymore and perhaps do live in houses, they still have these traditions which harken back to a sense of nomadism and going back to the road for these important milestones in their life. So... What does all this mean to the professional and how can we encapsulate all of that meaning that exists for the NACAN into something that we can do as both individuals and professionals? And I think that is comes in the form of reframing what we classify as sacred. Now, for something to be sacred, it's regarded as, it's regarded as having great respect and reverence by a particular religion, group or individual. Oftentimes, here in a Scottish context, we'll use that to talk about cathedrals, churches, perhaps standing stones. But my proposal is that we think about how travellers and that can relate to landscape and reframe our camps and stopping places as sacred to us. And here's a case study to explain it. So the Tinker's Heart, as I mentioned earlier, here's a, quite an old photo of it. It's recorded as having been in use by Nakin families since the 1600s. And it's linked with our history of internal colonialism because it harkens back to a time where Nakin were not allowed to step foot in a church in Scotland. We weren't allowed to be buried in the graveyards and cemeteries. We were seen as insanctified, so the opposite, sacred. So we would go here. And it's thought that these stones were laid by grieving mothers, widows, sisters and daughters of knacking people who went and fought at the Battle of Culloden. And we would go here and we would touch these stones and we would be in that place for our burials, for our marriages. It was seen as a blessing site. In a way, this landscape took the place of a church. Now, it's officially protected now as a scheduled ancient monument and it's been protected since 2015. And you can go and visit it and I'm happy to give you directions and urge you to do so. But here we can see the term sacred being cross-referenced by Nakin for perhaps the first time in a way that I think is very understandable to a settled person and a settled lens. Because we have here an, uh, an example of how the landscape has taken the place of what society would deem as a sacred place because we weren't allowed to access that sacred place. And so that sacredness we took with us into the landscape and we used it to experience the landscape. Another element of this sacredness is how the landscape, and particularly these camps, produce our identity as Nakan. It's important to recognise that to be a Nakan depends on what Nakan you speak to is a very different thing. Some people in our community will say, ah, well, you're only Nakan if you can speak Kant. If you can't speak Kant, then you're not Nakan. You're only Nakan if you've lived on the road. If you've never lived on the road and you've lived in a house all your days, you're not a Nakan. You're only Nakan if you can relate to these particular Nakan families. And if you can't pr prove those genetics, you're not Nakan. And so on and so forth. There's lots of different ways that communities define themselves. But what's crucial and what crosses over all of those different ways of defining is how we produce the identity. And that identity is produced by a storytelling. And often those stories connected with landscape and with the land. The evidence this, you see, you could take a traveller out of the road, but you couldn't take the road out of a traveller. And to me, that really encapsulates what I mean by the sacredness of the landscape, the road in this case. 
for knocking people, we learn about our people in the land. We learn about the oral histories. That's the only way we can learn about people who came before us. We learn about how our people have contributed to certain landscapes. That's how we learn about our history. We might be sitting in a house, but we might get some a song that relates back to the roads. Or older people in our community will talk nostalgically about life on the road. Young people will gather pictures of life on the road. Everything connects back to life on the road. And I don't think it's as simple as looking at the freedom of living on the road. I think it goes much deeper than that. And it goes to how we reproduce our community as Nakin and, and the identity. We reproduce it through our culture, and our culture is bounded with nomadism. So those two points around sacredness, I think, are the two which I believe prove the power of regarding something as sacred to protect it, to conserve it, but also to teach the story and the history to the next generation. But how can we physically do this? So my last couple of slides, I want to just show you some really practical steps that can be taken both as a professional and as an individual within your own communities and your own practice. One is to use tangible visualization to make the intangible tangible. There's a lot of words there. I will break that down. The second part is to build community cohesion. And the third is to ensure we protect the history of tomorrow. So what do I mean by making the intangible tangible? Well, I've expressed to you there that much of the stories connecting me to the landscape, talking about my belonging, talking about knacking people, don't exist in a written form. They don't exist in a, in a way that you can go and click a button and you can learn about it. You have to be knacking often, but you have to at least speak to knacking people. So how can we re-empower a connectedness with the landscape and a recognition that knacking people belong within the landscape? And I think there are many ways of doing this. You could, for example, put up signs like what we see here and is increasingly being used in the heritage sector with QR codes, which take you to digital databases. But even more simple than that, you could put up a sign talking about uh, an important part of Nakan history or an important place in the Nakan culture. Or even more localised and certainly reaching out to the individuals in the, in the community and in the audience here. Why don't you go along and speak to Nakan people who are inhabiting your landscape? Why don't you talk out when you hear the media talking about moving travellers on and evicting them again? Why don't you talk out when you hear that there haven't, hasn't been any bins provided or toilets provided at a local camp? And so now that camp's been closed down because there was rubbish left. This is all about taking proactive steps to preserve our heritage and our culture. Because if it doesn't take both the preservation of camps which have been closed down, which are no longer used, in the sense of signage here, to talk about the history there. Alongside the proactiveness of protecting the places that are continually inhabited and that I can still see as part of our culture, then if we fast forward 50 years from now, the heritage of Nakan people will be completely lost. That's what I mean by talking about the intangible and making it tangible, both in physical presence, but also in your presence as an individual with partnering with knocking people. The second part, and indeed it, it ties very closely to that, is to build community cohesion. If you're in a position of power or if you have a, a heritage role, for example, make sure that the seldom heard voices in your community, including the knocking, are held. Uh, heard, sorry. If they're not being heard, why? What are the barriers to that? Why are we not hearing knacking histories and heritage talking much more openly? And why are we not seeing it more visualised in a local area? What are the barriers to that? But also it comes to an individual level. And it talks about decreasing social inequalities. I gave you some practical examples there about toilets and bins, both very difficult things to access when you're living on the road. But think about what you can do as an active citizen yourself. How can you decrease those social inequalities to build community cohesion? And lastly, build understanding of the lift heritage in planning and infrastructure. So this is, initially it seems quite kind of highbrow, but it's not. Think about how 
your local area is. If you have a place, a car park or a park or a field where you know Nakin people come every year, year after year, how can you protect that place and work with the Nakin who use that place to provide better services there, to provide better planning for them coming, to make sure that we can create a place where Nakin people and settled people can both come together as a cohesive community. Up until now, we haven't been having those conversations, and it often means that Nakin are over here, settled people are over here, until a conflict arises over something like rubbish or something like that. And lastly, and by far the most important point in this whole presentation, is you need to recognize your duty to protect the heritage of tomorrow, both as a professional and as an individual. If you're knocking, take that opportunity to be really visual about your community. Take that opportunity to think, well, how has my culture changed over the past few years or decades? And how can I make sure that my community and people exist 50 years from now in the same way that's so important to me? But if you're not knocking, it's equally as important. And in many ways, you're in a better position in the sense of power. So many power imbalances when it comes to knocking people trying to protect their heritage and their history. And oftentimes those political imbalances, those social imbalances don't exist for settled people. So acknowledge the distress and historical narratives that I've shared with you today. Seek to empower the communities, perhaps by reclaiming a sense of belonging through reframing sacredness, talking about traveler camps less as, well, there's this traveler camp that turns up every now and again, much more as there's this sacred place that travellers inhabit every year. They come here, it's very ancient to the Nakin people. I want to find out why. I want to find out how people live in that place, why they come here, what does this place mean to them? Because it's only through restructuring the framework of misunderstanding and violence that's existed for centuries now that we can start to leave the track that we've been pushed into both as knocking people and as settled people, and see ourselves more as one community as opposed to a fragmented, segregated one. Heritage is an ecosystem. In a world of globalization and interconnectedness, we're really we're moving really fast towards losing this ecosystem. This ethnosphere that we've all inhabited for decades now. Scotland, Scottishness, whatever you want to call it, we're losing it. Things are all starting to become mainstream. Things are starting to become globalised. And there are strengths in that, but there are also weaknesses. And I believe that if we can gain a better understanding of how the inequalities that NAC can face, the barriers that NAC can have, and the lack of cohesion between NAC and settled peoples, then we can ensure not only that Scotland's ethnosphere is protected, but that we're protecting the history and the heritage of tomorrow. So that's the note I want to leave you on. I apologise for, for rambling on. I can get quite worked up about all this stuff because it's really important. Um, but I have got some contact details there. So if there's anything you feel you wanted to maybe learn a bit more about or I maybe grazed over and you want some more details, or if you want any of those links that I mentioned, please do get in touch um, either on my email or we can get us at NAC and Knowledge as well. So, okay, and I'll pass over to you. I'm apologising for going over time. Um, I just wanted to make sure I covered everything. No, okay, that's quite all right. I'm sure uh, we, we, we've only lost, I think, two people over the course of that entire talk. And usually the, the dropout rate is much higher, uh, actually, Davey, so you've done yourself proud there. Um, and absolutely no problems about going uh, over time. That's, that's what we like to hear impassioned um, dialogues about important matters. And this is one that um, I think we should all be at least aware of. And as you say, kind of um, shouting out about it if there are issues or if there are if there are ways in which we can help. So uh, by all means, stick any links, Davy, into the chat so people can um, can get to can. Um, can explore or, or, or learn more. Um, I and if anyone has any questions, by all means, you can you can raise your hand or you can you can type a question into the chat box. 
um, it's all quite informal um, at this stage. I'll just I'll just say what Caroline and Bill have said. Uh, thank you, Davy. Thank you um, so much. You are a wonderful advocate for your culture and heritage. Really interesting presentation and a valuable insight into the lives of the. Is it the Nakin? Nakin. I pronounced it Nakin. Uh, I, I vividly remember the the bow tents on the outskirts of Loch Gilpaid and the people who briefly attended the school in the 1960s. So I think a lot of people's memories, you know, can be attached to, to travellers. Um, it can maybe be, I think, there's not another worldly sense, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different way of life for a lot of people. So they will, it will, they will form a memorable part of people's childhoods. I can remember being up in Caithness and seeing Scottish travellers as well. Um, where I think there is quite a, there was or there there is quite a strong community, um, perhaps not so much nowadays. And in, in a sense, that is, I liked seeing them. I thought that was really interesting. And even then, I kind of had an understanding of there's this kind of the, the real heritage, this ancientness behind um, behind the behind them, behind what, where they came from and, and what they do. So. Um, yeah, interesting to to know Caroline's point there about um, um, travellers. Hazel, I think you had your hand up for a question. By all means, please do go for it. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for a brilliant um, talk. The, there are a couple of things. Um, I stay on Sky and about, well, up until about 15, 10, 15 years ago, every summer there was um, a, a camp would be uh, would form outside uh, Broadford, and they were there a few months, and it happened, if not once, twice yearly. And then that kind of fell away, and um, I just, I it was sad. I, I, I've, I've got a connection with the archive centre in Portree, and um, before the pandemic, we were looking at. Um, maybe putting um, some exhibits up that they have in their archive um, of Nakan, of travelling folk who, you know, in, in the area. But the other thing, my question, I suppose, it will run, um, the answer will probably run longer than this talk is scheduled, but why were nomads persecuted? And uh, why... Did people not, you know, even as far back as the 1500s, what what problem was there with nomads of, of travelling people? Yeah, it's a big, big question. It's one that I certainly don't think I have a total answer to. And it's one that I know scholars, um, including Ian Hancock, which is a, a, is a Romani child scholar over in the States, has spent a lot of time trying to answer. Of course, we've got Colin Clark here in Scotland, who's also tried, uh, and many others. To me, one of the reasons and theories that's always stood out as perhaps being most plausible is, and you're right, it was run longer in the talk, so I'll summarise it, but is the fact that nomadic people, no matter where you look in the globe, have always been marginalised, have always been excluded, has been seen as a social irregularity or something that you don't want to be. And the reason I think is because nomadic people are very difficult to control. More so when you look at the early 1500s and of course we all know about the changes in terms of um, moving from feudal societies to, you know, all of these elements I think compounded together to mean that if you were nomadic you were harder to tax, you were harder to control, yes. you were harder to put into serfdom because of course we we moved, right? So we didn't rely upon particular feudal landlords. We were very, very difficult to, to tie down to make part of the system, I suppose, in the modern way that we would call it. And there's a lot of writing on that. and uh, There's a lot of scholars, as I say, who have actually went as far to analyse parts of our culture and traditions, values, as anti-capitalist. And I think there's a lot of some really interesting finding there, particularly in the sense that inherited wealth doesn't exist traditionally in our community yeah. and it's actually yeah. seen as a, a bad thing um, and there's, there's lots of these stuff you know you, you've got a belief like mirror pen and um, so to give you a brief example um, when someone dies um, in, in our community 
um, there's a belief called Mirapen, which literally translates to death dirt. Now, Mirapen is thought to infect everything that that person owned. And so to inherit any of that things would bring the, the disease, the illness, the badness to you and your family. And so what we do traditionally is that we would give everything away prior to death. So if we knew someone was going to die, they'd give anything of value away. If they hadn't given it away, we would burn it to get rid of the mirror. And that's when you see these older photos of wagons burning or bow tents on fire. That's why we would do those things. So again, just one little brief value, but you can see how it's inherently anti-capitalist. Yeah. So I think that might be the answer to it, but we're certainly not there yet in terms of answering that question. Yeah, thank you. I will I will research more. <laughs> Ian Hancock, check him out. Thanks, Hazel. That's a great um, point of discussion there. And uh, Thomas, you would like to ask a question. By all means, go for it. And thank you. Uh, I enjoyed this presentation just so very, very much. And thank you very much for it. Putting out, uh, and I had my questions probably uh, would allow you to fill another couple of hours worth of chat. But uh, could you give us some idea of the linguistic relations of Kant to other languages? As could you give us an idea of what the DNA relations to other groups might be? Yeah, so I'll give you a brief synopsis. Again, this is something that would take a whole presentation, and I have actually given presentations on this. <laughs> <laughs> but to, to kind of briefly summarise it for you, um, the Kant is... Okay, so remember I mentioned the Romani diaspora and how they travelled from Scandinavia across to Scotland. Now, what we believe and think is that prior to them existing, the language spoken by the Nakin would have been much more uh, richly detailed in terms of uh, localised dialects and localised languages, such as Gaelic, for example. And we have certainly a lot of particularly West Coast families and Northern families who have for centuries spoke a very rich and deep form of Gaelic, sometimes with words that are unrecognisable to a settled Gaelic speaker. So there might well be some um, strength to that. Some in the community have stated that this language was called Gilaragard, backwards English, and state that the language that was spoken by Nakin prior to the Romani migration would have been Gilaragard. Langal's got some strengths to it. We're not quite there in terms of academia to know exactly. But what I can say is that when the Romani migrated here, they introduced a massive array of Romani words which have their origins in languages like Urdu and broadly Sanskrit languages over in Punjab. So we'll use words like Pani, for example, for water. And if you go to the Punjab region today, they'll use word Pani for water. And there's many examples of that. But we also have words which are totally unrelated to the Romani words. Um, and I think those words perhaps harken back to the older tongue that Nakin would have spoken. So we have words like fierstak for women, which is totally unlike the Romani word, uh, the Kant word, sorry, which is um, manishi. So we can hear the differences there. The late Sheila Stewart, herself an avid campaigner for Nakin Rights and Ballad Singer, she spoke about the two languages in a, a kind of a daily way. The way she expressed it was the Kant, particularly words like gaji for man, were used in the town by her family, but would never be used at home. They were seen as words only for the market, only for the town. And instead, she would use words like cool for man at home. Now, what academics have kind of thought about that, and certainly my own belief as well, is that in the 1500s, when the Romani moved here, we started to take on a lot of their words in the marketplace to trade, right? And we know that the Kant, a lot of the words in Kant are Old English, Ancient Norse, words that would be used quite frequently in the settled community as well in the 1500s. So over time, the Kant would have been used only in the marketplace, but as interrelations grew and as we intermarried more, it's thought that the Kant replaced whatever the pre-existing language had been. 
as our common language. And so now all young travellers, by and large, speak a form of the cant, um, which is um, quite a difficult language to get a hold of in the sense that being a cant, those of you linguistically um, kind of experience will know it relies upon a host language. Um, many in the Romani community call it a pagadi jib, a broken tongue. Um, so we can't speak fluently in camp. You always have to use principally the connecting words, so like the, a, stuff like that. Um, and we use English as our base language. And families on the West Coast and up North would have traditionally used Gaelic as their host language. So I hope that kind of explains it a little bit. I mean, it's a difficult thing to get into, but when it comes to NAC and people, there are two distinct languages. One, what many have called the Bureau of Regard, principally spoken by Highland families and West Coast families. Um, again, to what extent that was across the whole of Scotland and to what extent that was a language per se, can't really say. But what we can say is that the can't is the most common language spoken today among our community, and a lot of it comes from the Romani diaspora. I hope that kind of explains it. But to get into the linguistics of the Irish travellers and, you know, the Romani child and the Romanes and all that, it's massive. <laughs> Certainly writing on it, though, if you want to look it up. <laughs> Did you have another question, Thomas, to follow on from that? Or oh, um, it, it, any, perhaps it, I would monopolize it, but the second part of the question was uh, relations on DNA relations. Are there uh, oh, yes. familial relations there? Strong familial relations, particularly um, with. Romani, so, so the Borders families have a very, very strong Romani connection, principally the Blythes, Marshalls, Baz, um, obviously harking back to that original migration as well. Um, the families in the northeast of Scotland, um, again, you have strong familiar relations with Irish travellers and um, more recently Irish travellers, but also Romani gypsies. When you go to the high north of the country and, and the west coast, the West Coast, there, there has been some intermarriage between the Irish uh, travellers and, and the Nakin. But up north, um, you're really talking quite, it tends to be the exact same families when they're married traditionally with each other. And so they tended not to marry as much out with the Nakin community and have always been seen, at least traditionally, as you know, a kind of a bastion of, of what Nakin might have originally been as a community in, in terms of their family values and that kind of thing. Um, obviously, more recently, the term gypsy travellers get pushed out there. Um, the borders and lines between our cultures are becoming a bit more um, less rigid. Um, and so you mm -hmm. are seeing young Nak and Mary, young Irish travellers and young Romani much more frequently than we would have seen in the past. And so perhaps, you know, in the future, that might have consequences on the culture and how that gets progressed, I'm not sure. Um, in terms of the DNA, there has been a study done by Trinity College um, into the Irish traveller DNA, now which is widely available online. Um, they found that the Irish traveller DNA was wholly distinct from any other form of Irish DNA. And so it proved, in a sense, that the Irish travellers are an indigenous people to Ireland. Um, so that's one thing, and it, it disproved, of course, the myth that um, Irish travellers were simply fallout from the famine, which had been there for a long, long time, and Irish travellers had fought against, so that was good. There is a DNA study happening in Scotland. Um, I'm not a big fan of DNA studies. I think they have benefits in the sense of saying, well, you know, there was interconnectedness between these peoples and that kind of thing. But when it starts to be used to prove your genetics or prove your relationship to a culture, I, I draw a lot of issue with that. Of course, we've got blood quota analysis across, across in, in the US that, of course, had massive consequences for Native Americans and First Nations. But more so than that, I was always told by a good friend of mine, you could take two twin brothers at birth, place one of them in Saudi Arabia, raise a Muslim, place one of them in Israel, 
raised in Jewish, do their DNA. They're both from London, where you took them from initially, but of course they're very distinct and different cultures. I don't believe the culture can be boiled into the genetics, but there is a there is a project happening in Scotland um, by Edinburgh University just now. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have to say that the archaeology, sorry, gene, genealogy and kind of genetic studies, rather, uh, DNA studies are a kind of controversial subject in uh, in, in archaeology and, and heritage today. Um, not that it doesn't have benefits and kind of opening up new exciting avenues, but there are, as you say, kind of outcomes from this, which perhaps people didn't expect, and um, we kind of have to temper how we uh, well, analyze them. I mean, you have the example, an auntie of mine, um, for any of you who go on Tober and Dorcas, which I would massively would suggest if you haven't been, I'm sure many of you have been, but it's a great, great oral archive online. Um, but anyway, my auntie Charlotte Higgins um, is recorded on there quite a few times singing ballads and these kind of things. Now, we know in the family that Charlotte was not, biologically speaking, a Nakin. He had been found as an orphan, um, as abandoned in Lomfanon, up near Aberdeen, and raised with Nakin. Now, she spoke with a Nakin accent. She spoke the Nakin language. She lived as a Nakin. She knew our oral histories intimately. If you'd done her DNA, she wouldn't have an ounce of Nakin in her. So, again, it's these examples which, I suppose, throw the DNA to the wayside. But there are benefits. <laughs> I'm just yet to be kind of... Yeah, always, always good. And, and just to point out, I love to share this word cull. I don't know if you use that at all, Davy. Do you ever use the word cull? Cull, as in what way? Like as in I would, like a lad or a... We would use it as like a fool. Yes, but no, it's kind of taken on a bit a of a new meaning. A this. Yeah, like, oh, that, that boy's a cull. <laughs> uh, so kind of like me. a... It's 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 grown arms and legs because it can kind of mean like yeah a fool but also something yeah. like that's something crazy or or <laughs> good in a way but you can be a good colour and be a bad colour I think there's there's yeah. different I, I, I really struggle to yeah I really struggle to explain that one ah uh, okay I really struggle to explain that one to anyone outside of Caithness but it's still going strong in Caithness there's there's there'll be a few more <laughs> words as well yeah uh, and also deek which I uh, yeah. Um, I, I'm again surprised that people don't uh, don't use that. I thought that was more commonly used. Um, I th I thought someone else had a question. I think someone has. We've got time for maybe one more question, uh, which is which is really just um, um, I there's maybe two. Fiona Ford wanted to know. Did you say, Davy, that the church had forbidden Nakin from attending church? And the last question is from Rowena Arshad, who says. Uh, an illuminating talk, by the way. Do you feel that the that approaches used at uh, used, I think. Uh, do you feel that approaches used at present to include recognised gypsy travellers and Akin is challenging institutionalised discrimination, or does it still tend um, on a deficit deficit approach within the narrative of inclusion? Have you seen okay. that? I didn't see it. No, I, I think I think there's progress being made, um, but we're still very much being seen as a community not to be partnered with and to be done to, right? And, and what I mean by that is we'll still see exhibits which I think are fantastic. We'll still see, um, you know, we'll be seen as this community, right? This pilgrims of the mist kind of people, right? Um, that are seen as quite interesting and romantic even, right? Um, and it romanticises us further um, because oftentimes those approaches don't partner with the communities on the ground at that time, right? So we have seen some fantastic work done by some institutions, of course, Ock and Drain, for example, and, and some others, which I think should be used as a model to build upon by other institutions and, and, and professionals in the heritage sector. When it comes to the notion of sacredness and it being used um, in a professional capacity to reframe how we imagine traveller camps as much less of just somewhere that people stay in, much more as a place that's interconnected and bounded within the whole sense of being an academic culture, I don't think that is being used. 
Um, I think it's a real opportunity to be used because it can just using that one word sacred can get across to people in the settled community how we feel about landscape in such a succinct way. It's much more succinct than I have today. <laughs> but um I think it's a real tool that can that can be used. Um to, to go back as well onto the church element, um, yes, the church did ban us from entering my churches and uh well, religious establishments wouldn't even marry us at times as well, and um, often it being given to um, the, the local priest or reverend uh, to decide upon themselves because it wasn't seen as we weren't seen as good people. And again, this is you know evidence throughout the 1895 report. If you're interested in looking there, the church and our connections with religiousness, from a better way of putting it, uh, are scrutinized throughout that report. Uh, as a way of proving us as as non-deserving people. Um, the church, again, many think that it comes from uh, the Lutheran uh, examples in the sense that um, there are some old texts in, in Germany, for example, you can find where Roma, gypsies, travellers, whatever you want to call us, people who travel on the road were seen as something to be feared. Um, you know, we were even described as palm worms i.e. if you, they looked into your palm, they would infest it with worms for the sons and daughters of the devil. Uh, it was Scots law up until 1950s, 1940s, might be wrong on the decade, but certainly one of them. Um, the, <laughs> it was illegal to look into Mackin's eye because it was believed we would steal your soul. Um, you know, it's ridiculous now and we can laugh about it, but what that really shows is in a society where Mackin existed, it was very, very difficult for us to get into what was classified as deserving society, particularly in the church. Um, and you can go to some rural communities up in Caithness, for example, as well as throughout Highland Persia, and you can find where Nakin people have been segregated within cemeteries, or more commonly than not, actually buried outside the cemetery, um, at the side of the wall. And it's very, very common, um, because we weren't seen as, as deserving. Um, we've also had examples where travellers who had means were um, still put in pauper's pits because we weren't seen as deserving a headstone. Um, so, you know, all of these examples are there, but certainly in policy, it's existed. The Kirk gave an apology to the Nakin for their role in the forced removal of Nakin children. It was back in 2008 they gave that apology. Um, so, you know, it's certainly there, it's evidenced. I think more and more, particularly with um, the activists calling for an apology for the Tinker experiments and the forced removal of travel children, we will start to see all of this come to the fore. Um, and I think people will be quite shocked at the roles that these statewide institutions have played. Um, but it's worth noting that if you look across the pond to the US or indeed up north to the lakes and Sami peoples, the church have always played a very crucial role in the institutional racism and discrimination um, of minority peoples, particularly indigenous peoples. And whether religious or not, I think that's a testimony and something that we need to reflect on. And we need to make sure that we are not being biased or blindsided by an institution that we ourselves might respect. Well. There we go. I think you thoroughly answered both those questions there, uh, Davey. Um, and I think that's all that we've got time for tonight, actually. So thanks for um, for joining us. Um, and at this stage, um, I always quite like to pretend that we're back in the real world. And I ask everybody to unmute and give Davey a wee round of applause if you might be so inclined to do that. There we go, Davey. Um, thank, thank you so thank you so much for a polite talk. And, um, I'll definitely pass you on uh, to the next education officer because um, I'm sure we'd love to hear about uh, certainly the um, um, the the cant and the, the kind of Scottish traveller languages. That'll be a really great talk as well. So um, just all I've got to say is, is to everyone, thank you for attending tonight. For the great questions as always. Next. Month talk will be with Dr. Kenny Brophy, a former lecturer of mine, um, about the rock art of Kilmartin versus the rock art of Kilmartin.
in your Glasgow, so that should be a thumping talk. Um, uh, if you'd like to make a donation to the museum, there's a link there, but you'll also have received one in an email. Um, and uh, Davies just put his contact details in that chat as well, if anybody quickly wants to copy and paste that somewhere or make a record of it. Um, so to everyone, I just want to wish you a very pleasant evening and see you again very soon. So good night. Cheerio. Bye.